Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Fernando and I'm a GP in the United Kingdom. In today's episode, I look at the journey from diagnosis to treatment of a ChatGPT generated patient with heart failure and other comorbidities to see how the NICE guidelines could be applied. Make sure that you stay for the whole episode because at the end I'm going to give you the pathophysiological reasons why ACE inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers and MRAs are so beneficial in heart failure and I am sure that once you have understood it, you will never forget. By the way, I'm not giving medical advice. This is for healthcare professionals and it's only my interpretation of the guidelines. You must use your own clinical judgment. If you want to download a copy of my summary of the NICE guidelines on chronic heart failure, the link is in the episode description. Remember that there's also a YouTube version of this episode, so have a look in the episode description. Right, so let's have a look at our fictitious patient. His name is John Smith, his age is 68, he's a Caucasian man, with a past medical history which includes obesity, hypertension, type 2 diabetes and hyperlipidemia. His current symptoms are shortness of breath on exertion and lying down, a persistent cough, fatigue and weakness, bilateral ankle swelling, and the symptoms have been developing gradually over the last four to six months, but recently he has noticed more rapid weight gain, which could be from fluid retention. His usual medication is amlodipine 5 mg daily for hypertension, lisinopril 2.5 mg daily, also for hypertension, metformin 500 mg twice a day for type 2 diabetes, and atorvastatin 20 mg daily for hyperlipidemia. So, we have a 65-year-old Caucasian male who presents with shortness of breath, fatigue, ankle swelling and a persistent cough. On examination, we find the following. His BMI is 34, so he is obese. His weight is 97, and John says that this is about 4 kilos more than his usual weight. His blood pressure is 151 over 92, and on auscultation he has lung crackles. His heart sounds are regular with no murmurs, and his heart rate is 96 beats per minute. Palpation of the chest reveals a lateral displaced point of maximum impulse consistent with an enlarged ventricle. His oxygen saturation is 98% and his peak flow is 450, which is normal for his age and sex. Abdomen showed no hepatomegaly and there is no raised jugular venous pressure. He has slight bilateral pitting ankle edema and his urinalysis and temperature are normal. Right, we have somebody with lung crackles and a normal temperature and no other signs of infection, so it would be reasonable to suspect heart failure rather than bronchopneumonia. His main symptoms are suggestive of left-sided heart failure, although he also has some ankle edema, which is a possible sign of right-sided heart failure. However, he is also on amlodipine, and at this stage we cannot be 100% sure of whether this is a side effect of this medication or secondary to heart failure. Let's remember that typical symptoms of left-sided heart failure include cool, clammy skin, cyanosis, a laterally displaced point of maximum impulse consistent with an enlarged ventricle, lung crackles and a gallop rhythm. On the other hand, signs in right-sided heart failure include an elevated jugular venous pressure, ankle or leg edema, ascites, hepatomegaly and hepatojugular reflux. Signs of both left and right-sided heart failure can be present at the same time. In order to confirm the diagnosis of heart failure, we will need to measure the levels of the N-terminal pro-B type natriuretic peptide or BNP levels. In addition, and in order to exclude other diagnoses, NICE says that we need to also arrange an ECG, a chest X-ray, especially if it has a persistent cough, other blood tests including full blood count, renal, liver, thyroid function tests, lipid profile and HbA1c. Peak flow was normal for John, but if we are in any doubt about a respiratory condition, we should also request spirometry testing. Right, so we're going to send him off to have some tests. Should we be doing anything else in the meantime? 
Well, if we feel that clinically he is having signs and symptoms of congestion and fluid retention, NICE says that we should offer diuretics for short-term symptomatic relief. So I would go for a looped diuretic, something like frusamide, 20 to 80 mg daily, depending on the severity of the symptoms. And obviously, the higher the dose, the closer that you will want to monitor him. But we should be seeing him again for a review within a day or two. I'm going to say that his symptoms and signs are significant, so I will start him on frusamide 80 mg daily and see him in a couple of days, or sooner if he doesn't feel better. Right, so we organize the blood tests to be done ideally the same day or next day, and then we see him again to reassess and discuss the results. At the next appointment, John states that his symptoms are better, his breathing is easier, and his ability to do physical activities has also improved. On examination, his weight has gone down to 94.5 kilos, but John says that his usual weight is around 93 kilos. His blood pressure is slightly better, but still higher to 144 over 87. Remember that NICE says that for patients under the age of 80, the target blood pressure should be below 140 over 90. On auscultation, there are now minimal crackles at the lung bases, and heart sounds are normal and in sinus rhythm with no murmurs. His heart rate is also lower at 80 beats per minute. Oxygen saturation is 99% and there's also less ankle swelling. His blood tests show that his creatinine is 130 and his EGFR is 75, so reasonable renal function. His HbA1c is 60 or 8%. He has normal full blood count, liver and thyroid function tests. His total cholesterol is 4.8, LDL 3.4, HDL 1 and triglycerides 0.9 and his BNP level is 800 nanograms per litre. So, what do we say here? We know that if there is no heart failure, we would expect the BNP to be below 400, and therefore, with a raised BNP level, we can fairly confidently say that this is likely heart failure. And because the symptoms have had an insidious onset over several months, we're going to say that he has chronic heart failure rather than anything acute, that we should admit him to hospital for. It's important to note that the BNP level does not differentiate between heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, or HEFREF, and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, or HEFPEF. We will need to organize an echocardiogram for this. Also, we need to be aware that certain factors like obesity, Afro-Caribbean family background, and heart failure drugs can reduce BNP levels. Equally, they may be elevated for other reasons, for example, age over 70, ischemia, tachycardia, hypoxemia, including PE and COPD, renal failure, diabetes, or liver cirrhosis. John is both obese and has diabetes, so he has factors that could be influencing his BNP in both directions. His HbA1c is also high, so we will need to intensify his diabetes treatment. To know if his cholesterol levels on a tovastatin 20 mg daily are acceptable, we will need to look at his pre-statin levels to be absolutely certain that he is on the right dose. His other test results show that his ECG is normal with no signs of arrhythmia or ischemia. His chest X-ray shows mild pulmonary congestion only, and his spirometry is also normal, ruling out respiratory obstruction or restriction. So with these test results, we will discuss the diagnosis of heart failure with the patient, and we will proceed with a referral for an echocardiogram. Because the BNP level is between 400 and 2000 nanograms per litre, he can have the echocardiogram within six weeks. If it had been over 2,000 mg per litre, we would need to make it urgent to be done within two weeks. NICE also says that the purpose of the echocardiogram is to exclude valve disease, assess the ventricular function and detect intracardiac shunts. But now that we have a working diagnosis and we're likely to be waiting for a few weeks for the echocardiogram, we need to start him on some further active treatment. And we have several issues with him. Hypertension, chronic heart failure, diabetes, lipids and prevention of cardiovascular disease, and obesity. So let's start with his hypertension. 
John is already on step 2 treatment, a combination of two drugs, amlodipine and lisinopril, none of which are at maximal doses. So should we simply increase the doses of those drugs and then move to step 3 with three drugs if necessary? That would be the standard advice on the hypertension guidelines, but not in this case. The NICE guideline on hypertension says that for people with hypertension and chronic heart failure, we must first follow the guidelines on chronic heart failure. So if the hypertension guidelines say that beta blockers and spinal lockdown are considered a step 4, and the chronic heart failure guidelines say differently, we need to put the hypertension guidelines to one side and give priority to the chronic heart failure guideline. So let's have a look at the guidelines on chronic heart failure then. What does it say about treatment? You may be familiar with the advice to give ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, or MRAs, etc. But these drugs are recommended in HEFREF, that is, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, and the first problem is that we do not know what type of heart failure this patient has. Is it HEFREF or is it HEFPEF? Because when it comes to treatment, the advice for each one can be different. Could we assume that it is the most common type of heart failure? Unfortunately, that is not going to work, because at present, about 50% of patients with heart failure have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and the other 50% reduced ejection fraction. By the way, remember that heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is characterized by a left ventricular ejection fraction of 50% or more. Heart failure with reduced ejection fraction has an ejection fraction of less than 40%. And there is now a third type, which NICE refers to as heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction, which is when the ejection fraction is between 40 and 50%. Right, so what do we do? Well, we could look at the treatment of heart failure from two different perspectives. One, symptomatic treatment, and two, preventative long-term treatment. Symptomatic treatment addresses the congestive symptoms, and NICE says that we can give diuretics for the relief of congestive symptoms and fluid retention to both types of heart failure. We will titrate them up and down according to need, but in particular NICE says that in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, we will normally give no more than a low to medium dose of loop diuretics, for example, less than 80 mg of frucemide per day, and refer if this is not enough. The preventative treatment, on the other hand, is offered in order to reduce morbidity and mortality in the long run, and it does not necessarily improve symptoms in the short term. These drugs are ACE inhibitors or ARBs, beta blockers, MRAs, RNAs, which stands for angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitors, and SGLT2 inhibitors. But all these drugs confer these long-term benefits only to heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, and we should not be pushing them if the patient has heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Up to very recently, the same applied to SGLT2 inhibitors, but NICE changed the advice in June 2023, and now recommends dapagliflozin for all types of heart failure. So we conclude that not all drugs recommended for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction are recommended for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. However, the opposite is true. General management for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction can be applied to heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So let's see what drug treatment NICE recommends for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which is basically the recommendation for all types of heart failure, and how they apply to our patient. First, as we have already said, we can give low to medium doses of a loop diuretic, say frucemide, 20 to 80 mg daily to relieve symptoms of fluid overload. Our patient is on frucemide 80 mg daily, and this has had a significant improvement in his symptoms. There are still some crackles in both lung fields, and I may not rush to reduce the dose too quickly, although a careful reduction could be tried, for example to 60 mg daily, advising the patient to increase the dose again if there are worsening symptoms. Second, dapagliflozin is an option for treating symptomatic chronic heart failure, on the advice of a heart failure specialist only. 
John still has some symptoms and this drug may be beneficial, but in order to give it for heart failure, we would need to get specialist advice. But we will touch on this a little later. Third, we will review drugs which may cause or worsen heart failure and stop them if appropriate. Examples of these drugs would be both recreational drugs, such as alcohol and cocaine, as well as medications such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. Our patient does not abuse alcohol and on our advice he will cut down or even stop. He does not use other recreational drugs and is not taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or beta blockers. However, he is taking a calcium channel blocker and lodipine. Is this going to be a problem? NICE says that calcium channel blockers, with the exception of amlodipine, should be avoided in heart failure as they can further depress cardiac function and exacerbate symptoms. And they can also increase mortality after an MI in patients with left ventricular dysfunction and pulmonary congestion. So with that said, our patient does not have to stop amlodipine, which is fortunate because he still needs it for his hypertension. There was a question mark as to whether some of the ankle edema is secondary to amlodipine, but for now I will leave it as it is and reconsider this prescription later when more information about the patient's condition is known. Number four, we will consider an antiplatelet drug if there is atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, which is not always the case in heart failure. And Jos does not have this, so he doesn't need to take aspirin or clopidogrel. Number five, we should give a statin if the patient is at high risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease as per the NICE guidelines on cardiovascular disease prevention. John has already been found to be at high risk of cardiovascular disease and he is already on a tovastatin 20 mg daily. But the guidelines on prevention of cardiovascular disease states that after statin therapy we should aim for a reduction in non-HDL cholesterol of 40% or more. His current lipids show a cholesterol of 4.8 and an HDL of 1. So his non-HDL cholesterol, that is total cholesterol minus HDL, is 3.8. Looking at his previous records, we find that before the statin was started, his total cholesterol was 5.9 and his HDL was 0.9. Therefore, his non-HDL cholesterol was 5. 40% to 5 is 2, so his target non-HDL cholesterol should be 3, and instead it is 3.8. He's not hitting the target of a 40% reduction, and I would therefore advise him to increase the dose of atorvastatin to 40 mg daily, and recheck his lipids and LFTs again in 3 months. Number 6, part of the chronic heart failure management is the management of other comorbidities such as hypertension, diabetes, coronary heart disease, obesity, atrial fibrillation, COPD, etc. John has hypertension, obesity and type 2 diabetes has comorbidities. Let's look at the hypertension first. He is already on lisinopril and amlodipine and his blood pressure is not down to target. We are worried that his amlodipine may be aggravating his ankle edema, so I would probably be elect not to increase the dose at this stage. However, it would make sense to increase the dose of lacinopril to, for example, 5 mg daily, monitoring his blood pressure and renal function. This way, if he has heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, we are titrating one of the medicines that reduce mortality and morbidity in the long run. On the other hand, if he has heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, we will still be managing it correctly by lowering his blood pressure and improving one of his comorbidities. Let's now look at his diabetes, which is not well controlled with metformin 500mg PD. NICE says that the first step is always metformin, and if metformin is not enough or not tolerated, we will assess the patient's cardiovascular risk and status. And if the patient has heart failure, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, or is at risk of it, we should start an SGLT2 inhibitor. But you may be asking, did we not have to get a specialist opinion before giving an SGLT2 inhibitor for heart failure? And the answer is yes, if you're giving it for heart failure to somebody without diabetes. But if the person has diabetes, it is the perfect opportunity to give it and treat both his diabetes and his heart failure. But wait a minute, this patient is not on maximal doses of metformin. 
His EGFR is more than 45, so his dose could go from 500 mg twice daily to the maximum, double that, 1000 mg twice a day. Should we do that first? And my answer would be, perhaps at some point, but I would not do it at this stage. Although heart failure is not a contraindication to metformin, the BNF says, amongst other things, that the manufacturer advises caution in chronic stable heart failure and to monitor cardiac function and avoid in conditions that can cause tissue hypoxia. John's heart failure is far from stable at the moment, so I would not risk increasing the dose of metformin at this stage. With heart failure, there may be a degree of tissue hypoxia, which could put him at risk of the most feared side effect of metformin, lactic acidosis. In fact, some of you may be thinking that we should have stopped his metformin at the first visit. And perhaps that would have been a good option too, although you would be then dealing with a whole lot of other issues secondary to uncontrolled hyperglycemia. Because his oxygen saturation on the first visit was 98% and his condition had developed over many months, I wouldn't view stopping metformin as an urgent matter. Of course, if he had been truly unwell and hypoxic, that would have been the right thing to do. Another comorbidity to consider would be his obesity. So lifestyle advice, maybe early start and further referral for support will be indicated at some point. But he has enough on his plate now, so I would park this for the time being and revisit it in the future. Finally, in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, NICE says that we need to refer if there's poor response to diuretic therapy or if valve disease is discovered. But John has responded well to frusimide and auscultation of his heart did not detect any murmurs, so hopefully there will not be anything significant there but we will have to wait for the echocardiogram report to be completely sure. So in summary, we will continue frusamide, either the same dose of 80 mg daily, or more likely cautiously reducing it to 40 to 60 mg according to our clinical judgment, especially considering that we are going to start an SGLT2 inhibitor, which also has a diuretic effect. Something like, for example, dapagliflozin, 10 mg daily would be good. We will also continue amlodipine 5 mg daily and we will increase lisinopril to 5 mg daily, monitoring his renal function. We will also increase his tovastatin to 40 mg daily, checking his lipids and liver function tests in 3 months. And we will advise him to continue monitoring his weight and to let us know any concerns. I would suggest that we see him possibly 7 to 10 days later to review his progress and medication, but we'll also give him very careful safety netting advice to come sooner if anything does not go to plan. Okay, so when we see him next, John is feeling much better, his breathing has improved, as well as his tolerance to exercise. His weight is now 92.8, which is more like his usual weight, blood pressure is 138 over 82, on auscultation, his chest is clear and his heart sounds are normal. Oxygen saturation is 99%. Uncle edema has all but disappeared. And his renal function has remained reasonably stable, although since increasing lisinopril, his EGFR has decreased from 75 to 69, and his creatinine has increased to 143. We have also received his echocardiogram report which says that there is evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy, possibly the effect of prolonged hypertension. Right ventricular function and cardiac valves are normal and there are no cardiac shunts, but he has a left ventricular rejection fraction of 35%. So being less than 40%, he has heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So let's have a look at the guideline for this. For the treatment of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, NICE says that for first-line treatment, we need to give the maximum tolerated doses of an ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker licensed for heart failure. The beta blockers licensed for heart failure in the UK are bisoprolol, carvedilol and nebivolol. And we will not withhold beta blockers solely based on age or the presence of peripheral vascular disease erectile dysfunction, diabetes, interstitial pulmonary disease or COPD. NICE says that we should use our clinical judgment when deciding which drug to start first. 
but we will not give an ACE inhibitor if there is significant valve disease until the valve disease has been assessed by a specialist. And we will give an ARB licensed for heart failure if there are side effects with an ACE inhibitor. ARBs licensed for heart failure in the UK are candesartan, losartan and valsartan. If there are persistent symptoms, we will then give a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist or MRA, such as pyrolactone or eplerinone, in addition to an ACE inhibitor or ARB and a beta blocker. Okay, so John is already on lisinopril, so we should start him on a beta blocker next, for example by soprolol, starting at 1.25 mg daily, increasing gradually according to the BNF. Also, we should also gradually increase his lisinopril, and as the blood pressure drops, it is likely that we will need to discontinue amlodipine. We will use our clinical judgment as to how quickly the titration of both lisinopril and bisoprolol is, but NICE recommends doing so at short intervals, for example every two weeks, until the target or maximum tolerated dose of both drugs is reached. But we have noticed that both John's creatine and EGFR have deteriorated since we increased the dose of lisinopril. Is that going to be a problem? NICE says that we only need to worry and take action if the creatinine level increases by more than 20% or the EGFR falls more than 15%. John's creatinine has increased by 10% and his EGFR has only decreased by about 8%, so we should not be too concerned, but we will keep monitoring it. In terms of monitoring, we will do a full clinical assessment every review, measuring his blood pressure and renal function, including sodium and potassium, before and one to two weeks after starting the drugs and after each dose increment. We will also assess heart rate when given beta blockers. And we will not forget to monitor his HbA1c and his lipids after the management changes. NICE says that once a target or maximum tolerated dose is reached, we will monitor the patient monthly for three months and then at least every six months and at any time if he becomes acutely unwell. NICE says that we should monitor BNP levels only if the patient is under 75, there is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and the EGFR is above 60. So we should monitor John's BNP levels which will help track his response to treatment. A follow-up echocardiogram may be performed from time to time to assess if there have been changes in the left ventricular ejection fraction. AC symptoms do not improve with initial treatment with an ACE inhibitor or ARB and a beta blocker, we will consider the addition of a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist or MRA for example, something like spironolactone 25 mg daily, increasing to 50 mg according to response. I am obviously describing the steps that we would have to follow according to the guidelines, but in practice we would also refer him to see a cardiologist early on to ensure that he gets specialist advice and that his treatment is fully optimized. For your information, NICE recommends that the following drugs should be initiated by specialists only. Ivabradin, Sacubitril Valsartan, Hydralazine in combination with nitrates, and Digoxin. Other general recommendations for John will include an annual flu vaccination and a one-time pneumococcal vaccination, advice to stop smoking and reduce alcohol to recommended levels, and in terms of sodium and fluid consumption, we will not routinely restrict them, but we will inquire about his intake. And if John experiences dilution or hyponatremia, fluid restriction may be advised. And if John has high levels of salt and or fluid consumption, he will be encouraged to reduce. And finally, we will advise him to avoid salt substitutes containing potassium. Right, so we will make this the end of this patient's journey with us. But as promised, let's talk pathophysiology and the reasons why ACE inhibitors, ARBs, MRAs and beta blockers have long-term benefits in heart failure. And we will start by saying that heart failure with reduced ejection fraction 
even in its early subclinical stages, leads to reduced organ perfusion precisely because of the reduced ejection fraction. To compensate for this, the body triggers a response that stimulates the sympathetic system and the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Stimulation of the sympathetic system produces vasoconstriction and faster and stronger myocardial contractions, while the stimulation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system causes vasoconstriction due to the angiotensin effect and increased fluid and sodium reabsorption due to the aldosterone effect, both of which lead to an elevated blood pressure. Although these mechanisms may initially improve tissue perfusion, they also have a remodeling effect on the heart, eventually inducing harmful structural changes which exacerbate heart failure over time. The mentioned medications act through different pathways to reduce the heart's workload, enhance cardiac output and counteract the detrimental effects of the neurohormonal activation. The beta blockers do so by blocking the sympathetic system and the ACE inhibitors ARBs and MRAs by blocking different sections of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. They are all essential components of evidence-based heart failure management, reducing hospitalizations and mortality. Given that one of the problems of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system is fluid and sodium retention, you might wonder why patients aren't routinely advised to reduce their fluid and sodium intake. Well, in this world of evidence-based medicine, the answer is easy. There is currently no research evidence supporting this advice. While it might seem intuitively reasonable, we should refrain from recommending it unless there is concrete evidence indicating that the patient's salt consumption or fluid intake is excessive. But remember, this is only my interpretation of the guidelines. We have come to the end of this episode. I hope that you have found it useful. Thank you for listening and goodbye.